My background is I'm uh, a retired psychiatrist um, and I was working in the Northern Ireland here for quite some years, uh, based in Hollywell, uh, um, up in near Antrim for several years, and then also doing locums around the Belfast Trust here. And uh, so I've had a fair experience in psychiatry. Uh, I've also been working in many years as a Christian pastor, and so that's another side of my another hat that I kind of wear. Okay. Now, you may have heard this one before, and forgive me if you have heard it, but um, there's a man who was very troubled in his life, and uh, he couldn't sleep at all, and uh, he was troubled because every time he tried to sleep, he imagined there were monsters under the bed, you see? And so, Time and time again, he would try and sleep, but his sleep was very disturbed, and he became extremely distressed by these experiences, to the point that he sought psychiatric help. And so he was seeing a psychotherapist week after week, but really no evidence of any improvement at all, despite extensive psychotherapy. Anyway, in the end, he decided he was going to give psychotherapy a miss and decided that it was doing him no good at all. Anyway, a few weeks later, the psychotherapist met him in the local supermarket and he seemed absolutely fine. He was sleeping well, um, he was feeling great, and he was doing extremely well. And so the psychotherapist was amazed because he'd been treating him for six months. And so the psychotherapist um, said to him, well, what happened? He said, well, I went to see somebody and they helped me. He said, how many times did you see them? Oh, just once. Really? Really? And what kind of specialty had they? Oh, he was a behaviorist. He was a behavioral therapist. And what did he say? He said, well, it's absolutely no problem. The problem is very easy to fix. Just chop the legs off the bed, you see. <laughs> Anyway, that's just a slight aside. Um, but we're going to talk about depression tonight. And we're going to talk about what is depression and what treatments are available. Of course, depression can present in different ways. One lady said it was like this. She said, I felt as though I was in the midst of a great thick balloon. And I was stuck in the middle of it. And the harder I pushed out against the skin of the balloon, it pushed me back in. You see, she was expressing the fact that she felt trapped in this depression. Another lady said that as she was putting the children to bed, she was reading a bedtime story. And as she read that bedtime story, she read the same page three times and she began to realize that her concentration was severely impaired. And as a result of that, she sought help, and she was found to be suffering from depression. Of course, depression affects a lot of famous people, too. Abraham Lincoln, you remember, the 16th President of the United States, was severely affected by melancholic depression. But still, he was able to give leadership to the country at that very crucial time. In other words, he was able to overcome his depression to a certain extent. Other famous people have suffered from depression, like Winston Churchill, for example, who called it his black dog. And he found that his steps were, as it were, dogged by depression. And of course, he tried to deal with it by, in effect, drinking quite heavily. Now, you'll know this probably, but drink and mental illness don't go well together. And there are several reasons for that. Firstly, if you drink on top of mental illness, then you're more likely to get addicted to the drink. Okay. Secondly, of course, um, drink itself is a depressant. 
And so if you take drink on top of being depressed, you're likely to be more depressed. And then, of course, thirdly, drink causes you, if you're a bit under the weather or a bit down, it causes you to sometimes behave erratically and you might do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And we know, for example, that between a third and half of suicides have people, people have been drinking before they ended their lives. So alcohol is a bad idea. Other famous people obviously have suffered from depression as well. Catherine Zeta-Jones, she checked into a clinic, um, the actress, uh, you know, suffering from what we call bipolar uh, disease. And I'll come on to what that means in a few minutes. So we know that depression is fairly common um, and we know also that famous people can be affected by it. Now what I want to say is that the information I'm going to give here is really um, for this session, you know, I'm not here to treat you, all right, because I'm now retired from clinical practice, and so I'm not actually going to try and treat anybody tonight, but I am giving information that I think will be helpful. Yes, okay. How common is depression? Well, it is very common. We might say that at any particular time, 7% of the population might be suffering or 6% up there, 6% might be suffering from depression in Northern Ireland. And so that would give a figure for the country of about 100,000 people, which is a very large number. What is also interesting is that it's more common in women than in men. So we might say that one woman in four might be suffering from depression at some stage compared to uh, one man in ten requiring treatment for depression at some time in their lives. Now, what is interesting is that when you look at the figures for suicide, and of course depression is a very common reason why people might die by suicide, when you look at the figures for suicide you find there's three times as many men dying from suicide as women. So on the one hand, we've got twice as many women suffering with depression. On the other side, we've got the suicide rate three times as high in men as women. Why would that be? Have you any ideas? Men don't come forward and speak about their problems or seek treatment. Yes, thank you. Men don't come forward and talk about their problems or seek treatment. Thank you very much. That's absolutely true. Men tend to hide their problems. They want to deny that they have a mental problem. They want to hide away that factor in their lives. Or they might go down uh, and drink heavily and perhaps talk about it with their mates, but they generally want to hide things. They don't find it easy to seek medical attention and medical help, whereas women, of course, find it much easier. Pick up the phone and talk to your friend, you know? So that is one of the reasons, and I'm sure there are other reasons too. Now, what I want to do now is talk about what is depression? What really is depression? And how can it affect us? And really here, uh, I want to look at what the core things are that make us make a diagnosis of depression. Because you see, people use the term relatively loosely. They say, well, I'm depressed, I'm down. And what they mean by that often is that they're feeling low and down, maybe for a day or two or 24 hours, and in a sense, that's what they mean when they say, I'm depressed. However, in clinical or medical terms, we tend to think about it rather differently. Now, in the clinics I used to run, I would often say to people, you know, uh, how many days in this last two weeks have you felt pretty low and miserable all the time? And if they said, well, two or three days, doctor, or, you know, just one day, I would be concerned, but not perhaps as concerned as I would be if they said they were low and down pretty well every day or at least seven days out of the last 14 and they really felt low and miserable most of the time. 
A second key question I would ask is, are you still enjoying things? What motivates you? What gets you up and gives you a desire to do things? What is your motivation? In a sense, are you still enjoying things? And usually the person who's depressed will have lost all sense of enjoyment, all sense of uh, enjoying the things they usually enjoy, like whether it's going for a walk or watching a film or something like that, their, their sense of enjoyment would have gone. And so those are two key questions. Another area is that people with depression, they're often slowed up. They're walking slowly or they're looking at the floor. And I used to say, uh, you know, that I could often tell if it was somebody I knew quite well coming to my clinic, I could tell actually that they were depressed on the way down the corridor to see me because they would just look differently. Their voice would be low and down. Their head would be bent forward sometimes. Sometimes they'd had obvious loss of weight or at other times they might have actually um, not be caring for themselves properly. You could tell from the way they were dressed or the way they presented themselves. Sometimes they just looked down. The corners of their mouth would go down. They're looking at the floor, that kind of picture. And so in a sense, you could tell that on the way into the office where I would see people. And then, of course, you would also find that actually there were several things that you would look for before you made the diagnosis. And some of those were physical things. For example, as I say, somebody might have lost a considerable amount of weight. Occasionally people can gain weight, but usually there's quite considerable loss of weight. Secondly, the appetite will have gone, energy uh, will be way down, and the sleep pattern will usually be affected. Often we, people will wake up early in the morning, and at those times when they wake up early, that's the time when often they feel lowest and when even suicidal thoughts might be going around in their minds. That's the time they really struggle. So broken sleep, but particularly early morning awakening, is a feature loss of energy, loss of motivation, and often people will just want to withdraw. They will just say, I want to be by myself, and they, they stay in the same room looking at the four walls, that kind of picture. And so that is what you're going to get uh, in depression. Sometimes they're very slowed up. Occasionally, if they're elderly, they can be agitated and shaking and racing around. That can also happen. And as I say, no energy, often tired all the time. <coughs> And obviously in that condition, then you'll want to carefully examine their mental processes. What are they thinking about? You know, what are they imagining? And often you'll find that people are feeling extremely low, extremely down, and you might begin a, sec a series of questions, you know, how low are you feeling? Are you feeling very low? You know, is life worth living? Mm. Have you had any thoughts of harming yourself? Have you had any suicidal thoughts? And perhaps you might then go on to see if there's been any suicidal planning. All of that would be important. Of course, you don't start there because you want to establish a rapport, a relationship with the person first before you ask those probing questions. But on the other hand, if somebody's depressed, you want to ask those questions so that you know exactly where somebody's up to as well as low self-esteem and feeling really bad about themselves, often you get also a picture of guilt and somebody will come up with feelings of guilt. Now it's interesting that those feelings of guilt can be of two kinds. And this was brought home to me by seeing two patients fairly close after one another soon after I started psychiatric practice. And one of them was a man that I saw on the ward and I asked him how he was feeling and he said, he was the worst person in the world. And I thought, really? Are you the worst person in the world? He said, yes. Are you absolutely sure? There's nobody worse than you? <laughs> yes, he is the worst person in the world. I said, well, why? Well, he says, 20 years ago, he said, I made a mistake on my income tax form. Oh, really? And that makes you the worst person in the world? Yes. Could I shake that belief? No, I could not. What he had really was a depressive delusion. He imagined he was the worst person in the world, but of course he wasn't. And so we might say that's a kind of 
false guilt. On the other hand, shortly after that, I met another man who basically um, said to me that he felt extremely guilty and his guilt was really behind his depression. And I asked him what the matter was. And he said, well, it's like this, he said, you know, I've lived a very good life. Uh, you know, he's a religious person, he lived a very good life, but actually a few weeks ago, he'd been on a business trip abroad and he'd slept with a woman who wasn't his wife and he could not forgive himself. And so there was guilt that was behind his depression. And was that guilt real? Well, you can come up with the answer to that yourselves. Obviously, when somebody's very depressed, they can't concentrate very well. We talked about that earlier. And they may well have recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. And that, of course, is uh, a serious issue. Types of depression. How do we think about depression? Are there different types of it? Well, obviously, the type I've mentioned is the type that is most common, where basically, I hope you get the idea, feeling down and miserable all the time, not eating, not sleeping, pretty miserable, low self-esteem, don't want to do anything, etc. That's the basic type. On the other hand, you find that some people have that kind of depression, but at other times they have what is called a manic phase. And when you have a manic phase, actually what happens is you get speeded up. You're running around. You're trying lots and lots of different projects. Your thoughts are going very fast. And so you're keeping yourself up at night with your thoughts racing. You've got lots of plans to change the world. You're kind of going to spend all your money on this fantastic business project. And uh, you're going to, you know, be very, you're sometimes very irritable or you don't realize it. You sometimes even make connections in your speech which are unusual. For example, you might say, you know, um, uh, end one sentence with one word and start another sentence with a word that rhymes with it, you know. So um, that can happen. So the speech can be disorganized as well. And in that very erratic state, the thing is this, people in that state, they don't understand that they're ill. They have no insight. And so that's the problem, you see. Somebody's doing all that kind of thing, and if you let them carry on in that state, then they're going to wear themselves out or do something silly, like run around half naked or do something, you know, that would let yourself down or start this business venture that's going to lose all your money overnight. So you cannot allow somebody to stay in that state. And that's, but they don't have insight. Well, sometimes you have to say, okay, you need treatment, and you need treatment in hospital in that kind of situation. So that's the manic phase. Now, of course, not everybody goes that high. That's what we call a, a bipolar one. Sometimes bipolar two, which Catherine Zeta-Jones had, is not that high. The thoughts are beginning to race a bit, you're not sleeping so well, but you have a little insight and she checked herself into the clinic in that situation. So the insight is still partially there in that lower form of mania. But in the high form of mania, as I've described, that insight has gone completely. So we call that bipolar affective disorder because it's two poles. It's low and sometimes high, as opposed to the person who has low periods and that's how they get depressed. So bipolar is less common than unipolar. It's about 10% of the rate, although sometimes now we're saying it's a little bit higher than that. Um, there's rather more of a genetic component. Now what I mean by that is we know that mental illness can sometimes run in families. But because somebody in your family is depressed, it doesn't mean that you will be depressed, but it means that your chance of getting depression is maybe about twice what it would normally be in the population. If you have bipolar disease in the family, your risk is a little bit higher. But it certainly does not mean you're going to get it yourself. Another condition people sometimes talk about is <coughs> seasonal affective disorder, and in that sometimes people living close to the North Pole tend to get this more often. When the nights get very long and the days get short, in the evening time you might get the depression kicking in. And so you can sometimes predict it coming on a certain time of the year, and sometimes if you start antidepressants 
or light therapy before that time, then actually that can be helpful in sometimes preventing the onset of that seasonal affective disorder. So that's just a little bit about the types of depression. Well, what leads to depression? And here, obviously in many of these things, I'm giving you a slightly condensed version, you're aware of that, because to go into all the causes would be here all night with just on this one subject. But really, there are two uh, things that can be particularly, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily causes, but related to depression. So, for example, in your childhood, if you tend to be in a situation where um, you have loss of mother, loss of father, loss of parents, uh, you have difficulties with um, uh, overprotective or non-caring parents, if you have physical or sexual abuse, uh, then those things can uh, be factors. Also, I've mentioned that depression is commoner in some families than others. Also, we know that personality is involved and those who tend to be anxious or those who tend to be obsessional or perfectionistic, the risks are higher. And what is happening here is those childhood kind of experiences, they're having a subtle effect on the brain, a subtle effect that can then kick in when other things happen later in life. It doesn't again mean you're going to get depression, it just means the likelihood is there a little bit more if some of those factors are there in childhood. And of course also what we know is that stressful events often connected with loss are actually very key in depression. So for example, um, on my ward I would often have uh, more elderly people and I can remember one or two examples. One lady was desperately depressed because her husband had died. And it wasn't just a bereavement reaction, which you can get, a grief reaction. It was more than that. She was actually, frankly, suicidal and really, really very, very low indeed. And she needed hospitalization for her own safety and treatment. Again, people can uh, face depression through loss of other things. So again, people who had had a stroke or cancer or losing their eyesight, these kind of physical problems would often push them into a depression. Of course, sometimes it's other factors, loss of other key things. It can be loss of a key relationship by marriage or uh, divorce or separation or something like that. Uh, or it can be even loss of finances in the recent financial problems there have been, or, or other kinds of losses of that nature. Sometimes, you know, around the menopause, a woman might be losing something very vital to her and again struggling with that. And childbirth, although it's not a loss event, of course, sometimes rapid change can also lead sometimes in certain vulnerable people to depression. So it is loss, but it's also change. It's also sometimes a feeling of being trapped. And the example up there I've given of is a woman at home with her maybe three young children and she feels trapped in that situation. She feels there's no one to talk to, no one to confide in, and there's nothing she can do about the situation she's in. And that feeling of being trapped can actually be a key factor uh, in depression. Sometimes just rapid change uh, can lead to it. So, for example, some people can cope with change very well. Others struggle. And so if you change house, change jobs, lots and lots of major things happening all at the same time, you might be struggling uh, with depression as a result of not being able to cope with very, very rapid change. Of course, we also know that depression can be related to physical factors, so people with thyroid disease or, or uh, other hormonal abnormalities, post-flu, post-hepatitis, those kinds of things can sometimes also lead uh, towards depression. So those are some of the things that can lead to depression. Of course, sometimes we have to say, and I've had this happen, somebody is in hospital in front of me, why is this person depressed? And I say, I really have no idea. 
Because sometimes you can say, with all the evidence that that really we don't know why that person is depressed. So that can also be a factor. Who suffers most from depression? Well, we know that it's more common uh, in the divorced, the separated, unemployed, prisoners, people who've seen active military service, farmers living in rural areas, often in Ireland, don't have anyone to talk to, never talk to anybody else for weeks on end. Uh, those with other psychiatric conditions, obviously, who are suffering from a major mental illness such as schizophrenia, or you also have drug addiction problems, etc. Depression is more common. Young people living away from home in bedsit accommodation for the very first time. So different groups suffer from depression. And again, this is not a complete list. We don't have time to do everything in full detail. What about chemical changes in depression? Well, there are two substances that work as neurotransmitter. Now, a neurotransmitter is something that connects the ends of nerve cells together. Between nerve cells, you've got a little gap, sometimes called a synapse, and in that gap, you've got things called neurotransmitters, which carry the impulse across the gap between nerve cells. And those substances are noradrenaline and serotonin. And we're pretty sure that those are involved in depression because we know that giving antidepressants often raise the level of either noradrenaline or serotonin or both together, and they often work. They don't always work, but they often work. And that is connected to their action. Also, you find that in those who are vulnerable to depression, if you lower artificially the amounts particularly of serotonin, if you lower that, which you can do by diet, if you lower the amount of serotonin artificially in those who are prone to depression, sometimes you can bring on those depressive feelings. So it's fairly clear that those things are involved. But we also know, for example, that hormones are involved, and particularly cortisol. And it's certain that Early life events have subtle effects on the brain, which when triggered by recent events have an effect on cortisol and then noradrenaline and serotonin. And as I say, antidepressants tend to raise the levels of serotonin and noradrenaline in the brain. So that's just a little bit about chemical changes. Now I want to turn to, you know, if you find that you're dealing with somebody with depression, how can you practically help them? What can you do? And obviously, you know, you're limited to a degree by how much the person will allow you to help them. Obviously, that's key. So, for example, you know, uh, somebody may absolutely refuse help. Well, you know, you can do your very best, but if they won't allow you to help them, it's very difficult. But here are some of the things you can do just to be there for them. Sometimes just a gentle arm around the shoulder or something, if that seems appropriate, just to show that you're with them can be extremely helpful and important. Allowing them to talk and maybe gently encouraging them to talk about their problems. We know very much that it's that, you know, talking about things is very helpful. That's why, as I say, women, although they're depressed, quite often they can talk about things and not so common is suicide amongst them, you know. So being able to talk about the problems can be very helpful. And also talking about it can sometimes give you some way forward. So, for example, if finances are a major problem or work is a major problem or physical support is a major problem, then you might be able to find some way around those problems and help the person in that situation. Of course, encouraging normal meals and a normal sleep pattern can again be very helpful because the person may not want to eat, but you can gently encourage them to eat normal meals. You know, they may not be able to sleep, but you might be able to help them to get to bed at a reasonable time and keep a regular pattern. And of course, sometimes the family doctor might prescribe a small dose of a, a sedative at night for a brief period of time to help them. Encourage exercise. Exercise is extremely valuable. There have been studies that have shown that regular exercise can be pretty well almost as good as antidepressants sometimes with depression. Exercise is extremely valuable in not only preventing depression but also in its management. 
um, and encouraging them obviously to remain involved in life and not to withdraw. People with depression tend to withdraw. They tend to hold into themselves. They tend to want to isolate themselves. And of course, that is unhelpful. So for example, when I was working with the elderly, I used to find a lot of my time was spent encouraging people to be involved in some kind of group activity. It almost didn't matter what the group activity was, so long as they were involved with other people in a group situation. That was therapeutic by itself. Of course, some things might be better than others, and I'll leave you to think about that, you know. But those are some of the things we can do. Obviously, encouraging them to stay off alcohol and drugs of abuse, which will only compound the problem and make it worse. We want to be aware of the risk of suicide and not to fail to ask about it. And obviously, if somebody's suicidal, uh, don't leave them alone and seek professional help. And sometimes getting the person to see a doctor can be difficult, but if you can encourage them that they need some medical help, and sometimes to say, look, go and see the doctor for a physical checkup. You know, you look a bit run down, you've been losing weight, get a physical checkup, and, you know, encourage them to see the doctor who may be able to spot that depression is the problem. Don't blame them and say you shouldn't be depressed. And don't say, pull yourself together, that doesn't really help. If they could pull themselves together, they would have done it by now, you know. So that doesn't really help very much if you say that kind of thing. So in severe depression, the person will need help from a doctor. And, you know, they may need to be in a safe place. Why is professional help necessary? Well, you see, there could be an underlying cause for that depression. You know, they may have had uh, some other physical illness, or there could be something that underlies that depression that the doctor's able to uh, work out and diagnose. So that's important. Secondly, the doctor can be able to say, what is the depth of that depression? How bad is this depression? Because actually, if you can answer that question, it will help you not only in terms of how to help the person, but also it will give you an idea as to how what arrangements need to be made for their own safety. <coughs> Excuse me. Because obviously a person needs to be in a safe place if they have a very severe depression, particularly the very suicidal. Of course, into that equation comes what support is available for them. So obviously I've been around many people's homes who are seeing people who are very depressed in their own homes. And sometimes I'll be able to say, look, this person is very depressed, but I think with help and support from the family and with proper treatment, I think we can safely leave them where they are. On the other hand, I would go to see sometimes somebody who's living on their own, extremely depressed, not eating, not drinking, not looking at themselves at all, maybe suicidal. I'd say, actually, you know, it would be safer if you were out of your home and probably in the hospital in that situation. Now, also the doctor will be able to think about what help to give in terms of treatment, and that might be in terms of antidepressants or cognitive behaviour therapy, which I'll come on to in just a minute. The great majority will respond well to treatment and will recover, although the depression may actually recur. Sometimes you may find that one antidepressant doesn't work too well, and you might need to try a different one. So here, just a little bit about antidepressants. They usually take a little while to kick in, usually up to a fortnight. And there are different kinds working on different systems. They might work on noradrenaline, they might work on <coughs> serotonin, or they might work on both. So different classes of antidepressants. And you'd sometimes find in clinic that somebody would, you put them on an antidepressant and you see them regularly initially to follow up to make sure they're okay on the tablets. That's quite important, particularly with some tablets. You want to keep careful review going in those first few weeks. You'll then find they'll make a gradual recovery and they'll be fine. On the other hand, you might find you need to give a different antidepressant because they don't respond to the first one that you've given. So, Doing that can be a little bit tricky, but you'll usually find in the end that you'll find something that will work and they will be helpful. 
Antidepressants are not addictive, although sometimes you can get a slight withdrawal reaction from certain of the antidepressants, and they do help to restore chemical imbalance in the brain. So those are some of the things about antidepressants. And um, you may have further questions on that. Cognitive behaviour therapy is a very interesting treatment and extremely valuable. And it's based on the fact that um, there's always a thought that comes before a feeling. And those thoughts are often unnoticed and unchallenged. And the thoughts are generally incorrect. And if the thoughts are changed, the feeling gets better. Now it says they're doing experiments to check this out. So I'm going to do a little experiment with you. And I want, please, a female volunteer at this point. Would you like to help me? Me? <laughs> Come on. Now, I want you to, for the moment, pretend to be my secretary. And don't worry, you're not going to have to do anything nasty, all right? <laughs> all I'm going to do is, I want you to imagine that I'm going to walk in the office in the morning and say, hi, good morning, okay, and something like that. And all I want you to do is look at the ground. Okay, is that all right? You can manage that, okay. Yeah. So, good morning. Good morning. Oh dear. She has not greeted me. She probably doesn't like me. <laughs> she probably thinks I'm a bad doctor. Maybe I am a bad doctor. Maybe I should resign my post and do something different. Now, can you see what I've done? What should I have asked her? Are you all right? Or did you hear me? Or something like that, yeah. Okay, have a seat again, thank you very much. You see, it is very easy, particularly when you're feeling a bit down, to actually make mistakes in your thinking, okay? Because what has happened there is basically I've thought a thought which is incorrect and then I haven't challenged it by asking her about it. And what has happened, I've immediately felt low and down because I thought that she doesn't like me. Okay. It's very easy to do that if you're feeling a bit down. You can easily imagine that somebody doesn't like you because they may not greet you properly. But if you ask them, they say, oh, well, I had a headache, doctor. I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Uh, the children were up all night and I, I've had a really, really bad time. And so there's something else going on. And so if you ask the person, then in a sense you're challenging that negative thought in your head. But if you don't challenge it, then you can feel low and down. She doesn't like me. Or you can, you know, go to your office all day or think you're doing a bad job or something else because you've made a, a, the wrong connection. You've, you've thought the person doesn't like you and that thought has caused you to feel low and down. And that's the feeling. And then your behaviour is going, I'm going to stay in my office all day, I'm not going to see anybody, I'm going to resign. So the thought, the feeling, the behaviour we're all connected. And cognitive behaviour therapy is basically saying, let's start with the thought, the incorrect thought, the wrong thought, let's deal with that. And then if we can deal with that, then we can help the behaviour and the feeling. Because of course, as soon as I find out that she didn't hear me, or she, you know, I think, oh well, it's not my problem anymore. The feeling improves, I can just carry on normally. So the feeling and the behaviour are fine. So cognitive behaviour therapy is often getting at the thought and helping that thought process, which is why it's extremely valuable in depression. And um, of course, there are other therapies. Interpersonal therapy is helping people deal with their interpersonal problems 
uh, working on the, helping them deal with their relationships. When I used to go around the medical wards doing liaison psychiatry, I used to find that dealing with elderly people, I was horrified by the fact that many elderly people I saw on the wards, they did not have any relationships. None at all. You know, they had no friends and they had no relatives. Or their relatives, they weren't speaking to them. They had no quality relationships. Well, life is about relationship. And I'm sorry, but if, you're rela if you don't have relationships, then actually you need help with that because life is about relationships. And so working and helping people with their interpersonal relationships can be extremely valuable and helpful kind of therapy. Of course, family therapy, uh, couple therapy, bereavement counselling and other kinds of therapy do have a place also in depression. And we don't have time to talk about those in detail. Now, activity schedules are very, very helpful. You know, sometimes if you're depressed, you don't want to do anything at all, you know. And sometimes, of course, somebody's very, very depressed and you realise that they can't cope with this. But if somebody's depressed and not doing something, then you feel actually there's a glimmer of hope that they could begin to do something. And the very act of doing something is helpful. If you do nothing, then you're likely to, to possibly get worse. But if you do something, it's helpful. So for example, I would often find out what did this person usually enjoy doing? And they might say, well, they usually enjoy going for a walk. Well, I'd say in that case, look, tomorrow morning, plan to go for a walk. I know you won't feel like it, but just do it. And the just doing of it actually sometimes helps catapult people in the right direction. So planning things like activities that they would usually have enjoyed, or activities that may give them a sense of purpose and value, like they've accomplished something, even if it's something simple like washing the dishes or doing a bit of weeding of the garden, something that will give a sense of accomplishment. Those kind of activities are very valuable. So helping a person to plan those in, possibly with the help of a wife or other relative or, or friend, can actually really help somebody. So that kind of activity scheduling can be very, very valuable. We do know that um, other things can be useful. Now, the research on this is a little bit variable, okay? But, for example, St. John's wort is a herb that is widely used in Europe to help depression, and it has value. However, the difficulty is sometimes the available sources, it's not easy to get exactly the right amount, and secondly, it can interfere with other medication. So, you know, we, we as doctors wouldn't prescribe it, but I'm not saying it's, it's, it's not, not helpful. It can be helpful, but you've just got to be careful you get the right dose and careful if you're on other things because it can cause interactions. B and D vitamins sometimes can be deficient and replacing those vitamins can sometimes be helpful in depression. Fish oils can help, uh, can interfere with some drugs. Uh, we know that some things, saffron <coughs> and cava cava have been used and sometimes tryptophan and other things called 5-HTP and SAME can raise serotonin levels. Those kinds of things can be helpful. Now you may have been th through some of the research on that. The research is a little bit variable. Doctors wouldn't necessarily recommend these things, but they're out there and sometimes people have found them helpful. Other treatments, electric shock treatment, you may have had bad press on that or heard bad press. Occasionally, it can be life-saving. If somebody is very severely depressed and very suicidal and they are not eating and drinking, actually ECT, electric, electroconvulsive therapy, can be life-saving. We've seen it. Any doctor will have seen that. Somebody at death's door, you give them the shock treatment, they get better. Okay. You don't use it widely, use it fairly carefully, but it can be extremely valuable. And other things there, ketamine, deep brain, you know, all those kinds of things on the list there are a little bit um, uh, not really in common therapeutic usage. Okay, there have been some reports that ketamine can be valuable, but it's got such side effects no doctor would actually prescribe it, certainly in this country. Um, deep brain stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, they're very invasive techniques 
and uh, only to be used very carefully in very occasional situations. Transcranial magnetic simulation, there's quite a lot to be said for it. I'm not yet fully convinced about it, but many people are, and that's fine. And sometimes anti-inflammatory agents may have a place. So there are other treatments out there. Can we prevent depression? Well, yes. You know, as I've said, if somebody will talk about their situation, maybe they have an issue with uh, unemployment or finances or illness or grief, broken relationships, unforgiveness, negative thinking, etc. You might think, actually, if someone will talk about those things, then you might find a way to help them with some of those areas. You know, so talking about it can be extremely helpful. And, of course, it's important that we don't bury those problems inside of us, but face up to them in a realistic manner and find help. And when buried and unresolved, they're more likely to lead to depression. So just talking about things can be extremely valuable. Can we prevent depression in terms of dealing with difficult and painful childhood experiences? Well, the answer there is you might be able to help those things, but you don't do it when somebody is severely depressed, because actually you can stir things up and make things worse. But if somebody's in a recovery phase, you may then feel you want to try and approach some of those areas. It's not easy, it's quite uh, difficult work, but there are ways of accessing that and helping them with it. If somebody has a, a personality where they tend to be anxious and perfectionist or obsessional, <coughs> then the person may need to understand those tendencies and find a way of dealing with them. Um, I've talked about dealing with negative thoughts, checking those against reality. And of course, basic things like developing and maintaining healthy relationships, exercise, balanced diet, healthy lifestyles, all of that is very, very valuable. And of course, a few resources there that can be useful. Lifeline is very helpful in the acute situation. Aware Defeat Depression, Samaritans, and also a lot of very, very helpful booklets that you can download from the Royal College of Psychiatrists website on all aspects of mental illness, and you can make sure you're well informed uh, in those ways. CBT is available online. Some people like to try and do CBT online, and it can be done, although often it's better done with the help and support of a therapist. But there are a few things out there, a mood, gym, fear, fighter, beating the blues, Calypso, My Ray, and Living Life to the Full is a very useful site. And what these sites do is they take you through things yourself and you are able to answer questions and do some work online to help you deal with your issues. Although I say that often it's much better done uh, with a therapist. And finally in this session, I just want to talk briefly about some work by Professor Patricia Casey who's based in Dublin. And what she has done there is she's looked at 300 uh, papers that connect together uh, religious practice and mental health. And what she's done in those 300 papers is she's looked carefully at the connection between religious practice and mental health. And what she's done is she's found that those who regularly practice their religious faith show clear benefits. They regularly practice, not just believe it, but regularly practice their religious faith. They show several clear benefits. They actually live longer. Their marriages hold together better. They have less depression, less suicide. They cope better with bereavement, and young people do better in terms of less drugs, alcohol, and other problems. Uh, in, in that area. So six clear benefits and that is produced by the Iona Institute and you might like to have a look at it. I've got a copy on my desk there. Don't take it away, it's the only one I've got at present. But it, it's produced by the Iona Institute, that research, and it's very, very valuable. And also she basically says that if religion is practiced uh, by um, a large number of people across a population, then its benefits will accrue to society as a whole. So those conclusions are very interesting uh, from that kind of work and study that she's done. Okay, well that's it for this session, except that if you've got one or two questions, I will do my best, if I can, to answer them. <laughs>